I already know. This is going to be a long one. And I'm too lazy to type this all out. So. I'm gonna just use my real voice, because, you know, why not? Hey guys, Mish Repair. Before discussing the AU, I just want to make it clear that I will not be using my voice on a regular occurrence. I just thought it'd be quicker than typing it all out, because I am very lazy like that. Now on to what the video is actually about, the AU. I'm going to be starting with the kids and working my way up, because I feel like that is just the easiest way to do it. And I'm going to start off with Todd. And I'm going to explain some of his family, because they are quite important in shaping him who he is. First off is his father Terence. He was in the army before Todd was born, and he was quite high in authority and mostly followed out of pure fear. His mother was also in the army, her name was Waylon, higher than his father and had many soldiers who respected her. They soon gave birth to Todd's older sister Nikki, which Terence didn't like as he wanted a male to continue what he left off. And a year later Todd was born. After five to six years, Waylon requested that Terence to left the army with her to raise their children. Naturally, he denied, but she kept asking. She'd argued the military base isn't safe for kids, the mental effects on both children, and the physical effects on Tord. Waylon brought this up two to three times a day, and naturally, it started to get annoying. She then told him, after a few months of dispute, that she would leave the army with Nikki and Tord. He did get angry at this as he needed Tord, and he knew that many soldiers would leave due to how much she was respected. This caused Terence to decide to shoot her in the back of the head as soon as she turned around. Tord just so happened to be walking past the event. Since then, Tord was abused, not by his father necessarily, but mainly by the army, or those who weren't as associated with Waylon, all to shape him into the perfect soldier. After a year, there's two soldiers who were very close to Waylon made a promise to protect Tord. So the first chance they got, Tord and the soldiers fled to England to stay out of danger. The two soldiers happened to be Paul and Pat. He lived the rest of his childhood relatively normal. Next one is Tom. His family life was fine, but after a few years, they didn't really bother hiding the arguing from Tom anymore. His parents argued all the time in front of them. Usually after fighting, his mother, Alice, would retreat to the kitchen or the bedroom and heavily drink herself away. Meanwhile, his father, Steve, or Stephen, would go out and sometimes smoke. These fights led to how Tom discovered alcohol and its benefits. He walked in on his mother, passed out on the floor with bottle in hand. He was curious and wanted to know why it was so addicting, then one thing led to another. Because of how early the addiction started, it was hard to put off, but he did until the age of 17 when he revisited alcohol. Back to his childhood. He and his mother went to the park for a bit of fresh air. However, on the way back, his mother tripped on a bridge and fell off and into the river below. She was dragged under the water and she drowned. Tom was too young to understand. Tom's father is an already known cause. Because of how young he was when they died, he couldn't remember what they looked like. Therefore, he replaced all memories with a bowling ball and a pineapple. Next person is Ed. He was part of a very privileged family. However, they weren't the best. The only one who was nice to him was his older brother, William. Meanwhile, his father verbally abused him a lot, even under his breath in public. His mother, however, neglected him and his brother, at a certain age, he left. Run away, if you will. Finally, Matt. He only grew up with his mother, Jessica, and I'm not sure how many of you will understand, but she's kind of like Leanne Cartman. She used to be around town, if you know what I mean, and she also didn't raise her kid in a very efficient way. She basically let him get away with everything, which made it hard for her to tell him no. As for his father, I don't want to explain or reveal anything until my 8K special, which is meeting Matt's family. Moving on to the time Todd was gone. Okay, I know it's a big jump, but trust me, just go along with it. Todd returns to the Red Army with Paul and Pat. He 
He remembers the army vaguely and wants to feel the same rush as he did during moving targets. He was placed in the sector with those who weren't as skilled with close-range weapons like their fists and knives, as well as firearms. Obviously, he stood out from the rest due to his knowledge on this, and he quickly moved up the rankings, surpassing his father, who was still there. Perhaps three to four years of his absence, he was offered to be the next Red Leader. In short words, the title is inherited like the Robins in DC. Naturally, he accepted, and the past Red Leader left unknowingly to keep his identity a secret. The same with Tord. He entered his role unknowingly to the army to keep his identity a secret. It didn't take long for the army to realise that he was different, but what could they do? An important event in my AU is actually regarding Fundead, and more specifically, this kid. This is what myself and I think few others refer to as Asdaf Kid. However, I have given him a name of Azriel, as they both sound similar, Asdaf and Azriel. For more clarification, he was the kid given a gun by Tom. After a while of fighting with zombies, Azriel was cornered and was scratched on all the ruckus. He accidentally ran into Tord while escaping, and Tord, with nothing entertaining him, decided to look after him. He found a cure of sorts which stopped the infection. The zombie's curse that it eats away at your mind and preserves your age. The cure stopped the infection continuing, meaning his mind was saved, however his age was still preserved, as well as remaining the same mental age. Upsides include zombies recognise him as a zombie and he is granted immortality due to age preservation. Unfortunately, it causes him to be weakened and unable to experience life. However, this new person in Todd's life has disadvantages to towards Tord later in the future. And jumping all the way to after the end, because not much really significant happened during anything else. Now, this one took a while to think of, because I was trying not to make it like every Tom Tord fanfiction ever. But I did my best, so... How they reunited was hard, because I fanfics exist and it's hard to not make it sound like I pulled it from there but one day they all bumped into each other reasons being Ed wanted to go get groceries and he didn't want to go on his own so he got Tom and Matt to vibe with him and Todd was on his way to Paul and Pat's they lived close to the main house so Todd could easily get to them in any case the main three wanted to walk past the old house on the way back for old time's sake they stood in front of the ash and the broken walls that were barricaded by police tape they were just stood in silence, remembering all the good times. The reason Todd didn't hear them. And he accidentally bumped into one of them, and also lost his balance simultaneously. They turned to look at him, too shocked to say anything, and Todd backed up was ab- and was about to make a run for Until Matt dropped his bags, walked over, kneeled down and hugged him. He then said quietly, I don't forgive you, but I am happy that you're not dead. They ended up bringing him home, and he stayed with Tom, like every good fanfic. He stayed with Ed, as Matt only had his portraits and statues, and Tom would probably rather to jump out of a window. A lot of the time that they spent helping him was with walking, as he hurt his leg extremely bad and couldn't walk for more than a minute without falling over. They made it clear that they weren't forgiving him for the incident, but they were willing to help him. Next up, I'm going to be discussing the injuries that they got from the end. Or more specifically, Tom and Todd, as Matt and Ed were nowhere near the explosion. Well, either of the explosions, or the debris. Starting with Todd, as he had the worst part of it. Obviously, he had his face exposed to the explosion, as well as his arm, leg, and entire right side of his body in general. The explosion singed through a thin piece of skin over his mouth, resulting in both gum and teeth being visible. He also lost 40% of his hearing and 55% of his vision, both to his right, and also temporarily forgot how to speak English for a week or two. He got a few broken bones and had a few temporary respiratory issues from being crushed by a load of metal. Long-term effects is that he had a lot of twitches, The explosion damaged his nerves, he was no longer in control of his hand or face muscles, and they'd randomly twitch. Tom usually makes fun of him for it. Tom was crushed by a lot of debris, and was very close to one of the explosions. The house's explosion caused him to have major scourge on his back, and the debris that fell on him gave him a massive head injury. It broke the top of his skull, revealing his brain. He would have died if it wasn't for the monster. 
It immediately performed a protective scalene over his brain, and it caused him to survive. Then there's After the End and Life with Todd again. It was very awkward to move back in, and Todd found it quite hard to adjust living with the others again, especially after the whole fiasco he caused. Matt would be the one around Todd all the time to help him walk around and also so he wouldn't be alone. Tom and Ed would check up on him every now and again. Todd slowly started playing back into his old life, which Ed and Matt were happy about, while Tom was more hesitant. It lasted for a few years, maybe two or three, even four, when he suddenly remembered the event and became overwhelmed by the, all the emotion and all the kindness. It drove him to leaving again. Next up is What the Future. Tom and Matt never intended on joining the army, but it was all in Ed's plan to have people on the inside to gain information. It took a lot to gain Todd's trust, which is why Tom was put as his assistant, so he could be supervised, while Matt was put as Squadron Leader 3, as they are extremely loyal to the army. Ed helped the Revolution Act, as he doesn't like Todd or the army and its domination. He also teamed with Hillary and the British Army to help. The further he got into the revolution, the more impatient he became. It caused him to become more aggressive towards everyone, including Tom and Matt, which made them less up for the act. This only made him more annoyed. He deemed them traitors despite their willingness to help. This caused them to fight against Tom and Matt, yet he still used their relationships with them to get out of situations. Matt 100% supports Ed, as he doesn't seem that keen on world domination but Ed is making it very difficult to work with. Matt is more of the middleman in the situation, he doesn't know what he wants anymore. He wants to help Ed, but he also wants to keep people safe, as he believes the army members aren't bad, just misguided. He also realises Ed's own hypocrisy, as he has witnessed many times of Ed abandoning them and showing signs of trying to kill both him and Tom. It's making him question everything, so he just helps both sides. Unlike Matt, Tom is more for helping the army because of his relationships there, mainly the one with Azriel. He is also open to helping Tord due to Ed's refusal to cooperate. He is more calm, therefore has more control over the monster, but he does get stressed easily. He is Tord's assistant slash right hand man and he was put there to be kept an eye on, but as he gained more trust, he gained more attached to the army. Obviously, Todd's goal is world domination and to solidify the Red Army's legacy forever. Another big goal of his is to get rid of those who help the revolution. There's not much to it. One of the two main events that happened in my AU is Azriel's death. In the middle of the fight of London Bridge, Azriel found his way onto the battlefield. Ed was observing when Azzy ran up and started yelling and punching Ed's leg. Just despite Todd, he shot Azriel. Not only was Todd distraught, but Tom was as well. At first, Tom thought nothing of Azriel, but because of accompanying Todd most of the time, he saw Azzy at least once or twice a day. Azriel also found Tom interesting and liked talking to him. He was soon seen as a second father figure and was the main reason for helping the army. This also made Tom resent Todd due to killing Azriel, despite many promises to keep him out of it. The end of my AU is on the day of the revolution. Ed and the rest of those of the revolution put their plan into action and attacked the base. Ed wanted to be the one to kill Todd, so he went on to find him, while also killing everything trying to stop him, one of which was Tom. They both felt betrayed by one another, and they did end up fighting, but then Todd jumped to push Tom out of the way from something that would kill him. He did this simply because of how much he respected Tom. While Tom was distracted, Ed shot him in the head. Matt witnessed this and started to attack. He couldn't believe the things Ed was doing. After falling to the ground, Ed was pinned to the floor, and after some struggle, he quickly got Matt off and crawled towards Todd's body, as he had seen on multiple occasions that he has a pocket knife up his sleeve. He quickly obtained the knife and stabbed Matt. Ed's own the only one left. After a few months and regaining his sanity, he soon regretted what he did. He wrote in a letter that he wished to be buried next to his old friends, and that he was then found dead due to an overdose. His wish was honoured and later a statue was built of all four of them, before the conflict. Next is the neighbour trio and Teddy. Not much to say about this one as the only thing significant about them are their deaths, so this will be fun. Teddy is the neighbour counterpart of Tord, however he didn't know Eduardo or John personally as he was only friends with Mark. 
One day while driving, Mark wasn't paying attention to the road and unfortunately crashed. Teddy died on impact. After Mark's death, he was able to see Teddy appearing either right behind him or a short distance away, accompanied with a TV static noise, varying on volume depending on distance. Apparently this has been happening since the day he died, observing Mark every day. Mark was the only one who could see Teddy. Mark died by being crushed by the Beaster Bunny. This broke every bone in his body, caused his lungs to collapse, and, to be honest, he just looked like a smashed tomato. He came back to continue looking after Eduardo, guardian angel of sorts. John returned as a vengeful spirit, target being Eduardo. At first, it was taunts, appearing suddenly in front of him, and then disappearing. But later on, it was more violent, i.e. murder attempts. His reason was that Eduardo had mentally and physically abused him and numerous times wishing he were dead. And when he did die, Eduardo decided he was sorry. John found it unfair, a joke. John decided it was then his turn. When John died, Eduardo became extremely depressed. He often had little to no regards for his life in any life-threatening situations, which is what led to Mark's death. This played with his mind even more, and he just wanted things to go back to normal. Then when John came back trying to kill him, it really didn't help. He ended up going to doctors and therapists about seeing ghosts or people he's seen die. Doctors prescribed him with medicines and usually think he's schizophrenic. The lack of help led him to take his own life. And now Kim and Kat. Prior to meeting one another, they were both con artists, usually a solo act, but they came together to catch a common score. They succeeded and went bigger and more ambitious. Not long after, they discovered feelings for each other and had their final score before their marriage and settling down. Then someone Kim once con took revenge. They took away the one thing that she loved, her wife. She was hospitalised for a few months after the fight in an alleyway. Kat wanted to find this person and do the exact same. Hurt someone close. Now on to Saluna Turks. I had a detective that had been in the headlines of, among other famous detectives, not Sherlock Holmes, because he was around in the 1890s, not the 1850s, where my AU was set, but other detectives. That's why he was called by the Queen to find her son. Q Salunatics, my favourite episode. Heh, <laughs> I have such a gold sense in humour. <laughs> Nothing changes during the duration of the episode. Most of the impacts are afterwards, but my AU follows the Partners in Crime AU. For those who don't know, I will try and explain it, but I'm not 100% on all the details, so if I get anything wrong, I apologise. Todd, the Red Bandit, and Thompson are rivals. They encountered one another countless times, however, the bandit would always slip out of their hands. Once in an altercation, Tom injured the bandits badly, as well as losing his eye, and he noticed Todd had the same injury. He put two and two together and faced the bartender. However, Todd proposed a deal. He would help him catch bigger and or more dangerous bandits, as long as he wouldn't be arrested. It took a while, but he agreed. Most of the time is spent at the bar, and usually it's Ed getting Thompson to tell stories of the Red Bandit, as he is very interested. He also finds it strange how Todd knows a lot about the Bandit, but he doesn't think much of it. A few days before leaving back to England, Matt was confronted by many townsfolk after learning that he was from a family that used to exploit the area a lot. They decided a stake was a good punishment to the royal family. He was burnt badly, however, Edward and Thompson managed to get him off, then had to be accompanied everywhere. When leaving America, Thompson was quite hesitant on leaving Todd freely roaming, but he dealt with it. On the train home, Matt noticed a horse chasing after them. Thompson looked out the window, seeing the red bandit chasing after them. After so far, he stopped, grabbed his hat and waved goodbye. After 89 months of living in London, Thompson just couldn't adapt, so he moved back to Spitbucket. And this is just a quick one, but I thought I'd add it in anyway, uh, with Ellsworld. I always thought Ellsworld wasn't really just a gender bend, but just a world where everything was slightly changed. Like the box, one has donuts, the other has an evil genie thing. But the swords are magic, the other sword is shit. Uh, Ed has Ringo, L has tequila, and there's quite a few other differences. One of which being their genders, so... Yeah, I just think that it's a slightly different world, not a gender-bend world. And there is a lot more in my AU that I 
just can't put down because I'm, to be honest, over. I'm just done with this video. I, I'm finished with it, and they don't really have a specific area to go. I might make a separate video discussing some less important things that are still somewhat important. But I don't know. This has gone on for too long. Um. Yeah, I'm done with it. I'm finished with the video. Goodbye. I don't want to step away.